That is a uh, seal working dog uh, in Iraq uh, with one of the guys there. Uh, use the dogs extensively over there. They're uh, brilliant animals uh, and uh, they have certainly uh, saved a lot of lives. These dogs are awarded medals. We have uh, dogs and seal team that have been awarded the Navy Cross and uh, Purple Hearts and everything on down. Uh, but that's kind of what they look like now. And it's, it's very hot over there uh, as well. And a little bit of intimidation factor. The uh, dogs get shaved into uh, mohawks. Very uh, fierce looking animals. Fly on the helicopters. Uh, wear go uh, they're just, they're badasses. But uh, when I was a young SEAL, and I reported the SEAL team too, uh, you know, we had a uh, just a kind of a museum area, just uh, the archives, the pictures all over the walls of, you know, just all the old frogmen and uh, things that they had done, all the Vietnam, the UDT, all the crazy stuff. And my favorite picture when I walked in, I was just always set back by it, uh, was that picture right there. And that is the SEAL we're going to talk to tonight. Uh, him and another SEAL. This is uh, Master Chief uh, Bill Brumauer, uh, and that is his dog Prince. And if you'll notice on Prince uh, down here, he is wearing a purple heart. Uh, so Bill and another SEAL uh, basically invented uh, the dog program in SEAL Team and deployed with these dogs over to uh, Vietnam. Uh, Bill and Prince went back a long way, but they are at an award ceremony, a medal uh, ceremony at the, the team, and uh, Prince is being awarded the Purple Heart, among other things they got. Bill, uh, Bill's a badass. Uh, uh, he's a very tough guy, but he started that uh, dog training program, and if you read a bit, if you search uh, Bill Brumiller's uh, name a little bit, you'll come up uh, with a uh, kind of book, it's an online book that's up there. But it talks about Bill uh, sitting on ambushes with Prince and how uh, Prince would uh, just never move. He'd just lay there right next to him. Uh, but uh, 10 minutes before anything bad happened, uh, uh, Prince would alert. And he'd just uh, throw those ears up and he'd look in the direction. And he'd say, sure enough, you know, 10 minutes later, here they'd come. You know, so the dog was amazing. Uh, but he perfected parachuting with the dogs. And I'll try to get Bill to tell that story tonight. I know the story, but... Uh, Prince used to have to be muzzled uh, when he would jump him. Uh, so the two of them, uh, Prince wasn't really wild about being parachuted out of an airplane, but uh, uh, pulled it off and he was fine when he hit the ground. But uh, Bill used to have to put a muzzle on him uh, for uh, uh, Prince's antics when he was uh, slung out of an airplane. So uh, very cool stuff, very cool stuff. So uh, yeah, you know, some of these, uh, some of these guys in the teams, you know, uh, just uh, amazing, amazing guys that go all the way back. So you think of the modern warriors, Iraq, Afghanistan now, and, uh, you know, the, uh, we all got our start uh, from guys like uh, Bill. So we'll give Bill a, a quick phone call here, shoot the shit. Uh, Bill uh, joined the Navy in 1954 and uh, was one of the original plank owners at SEAL Team 2. So, uh, underwater demolition team was selected uh, to go there, and uh, he's uh, he's quite something. You can read a lot about Bill. He's uh, very outspoken about these three seals being court-martialed as well as I am. Uh, just hits a real sore spot with us, and uh, so that's all coming up here real soon. So we'll give Bill a call and uh, shoot shit with him. Oh, he's a badass. Hello. Hey, Bill. How you doing? It's Don Shipley. I'm doing just fine, Don. How are you? I am fine. I was uh, talking to you a little while ago before I did this, and I mentioned that picture uh, of you and the uh, dog at the award ceremony, Prince. Right. Yep. right. I got on uh, SealTeam2.org, Bill, and that picture was up there. And uh, so I just showed the guys on here that are watching online. So uh, very cool stuff, man. But you know that dog at that, uh, uh, at that award ceremony, the dog got the purple heart. Yeah, uh, it's got a, uh, now that was Prince. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It, was, it was the first dog we had, and uh, later on went over to uh, Mike Bailey, and uh, normally they can't transfer dogs from one handler to another, but Prince was just one of those exceptional dogs that uh, he could do that with, and Bailey took him down to uh, Fort Benning for military training, and uh, which I had not done, mine went, was all police work. And uh, but he still worked out fine, and uh, uh, turned out to be a real good dog. The only sad part about it is that uh, one of our leaders required us to leave all the dogs in country after we 
you know, when we finally secured and uh, came back to the States and stopped going over. And it's, that's really a shame because those dogs have been back and forth a couple of times. Yeah, I had heard that story. It bothers me being a dog lover. I know you're uh, uh, familiar with the whole lone survivor story and Danny Dietz that was killed on that day. Well, I've got his two dogs here in the house. I've got a dog party going on up here. Uh, so Danny Dietz's two dogs are uh, here now and uh, uh, staying for the weekend. But uh, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about your bud stuff. Now, you and I, outside of being SEALs, uh, we were chief petty officers. Uh, but you and I were, uh, not only did we uh, quit school and join the Navy, but you and I were uh, bosun mates as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I started off, uh, ironically, uh, my first duty station was Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, I wanted to uh, get on a ship that was going to Korea or something, but at the time I didn't know anything about those little wooden minesweepers. So uh, fortunately for, for me, the Navy put me into mess cooking for the first you know, 90 days, which is usually what happened to most guys. And uh, I learned that this uh, uh, cook duty wasn't bad. It was uh, three days on, three days off, and every other weekend. So I became a commissary uh, striker. And then once I went through training, I realized that that wasn't going to be such a good rate to have. So uh, I changed my rate to signalman, and then uh, again later on to bosomate. So uh, there was, you know, you went where the rates were open at that, that particular time. Well, you know, Bill, they, uh, now they have the SO rate, but uh, my son was a bosun mate before they switched that over. And, uh, Bill, I sleep with a bosun mate uh, every night and have for 27 years. <laughs> and I married one uh, before I became a SEAL. So uh, this this family, uh, outside of a huge military background, is uh, filled with bosun mates. Well, I think you're doing all right because next to, next to God there's bosun mates. <laughs> yeah. Any man can wear a left arm right, but only God can make a bosun mate. That's a fact. You got it. You got it. Bill, you went to, what got you uh, interested in SEAL team? Well. But, or UDT, bro. Well, really, uh, at that time, we didn't have SEAL teams, but uh, what got me interested was my time was coming up on shore duty to get transferred to sea, and it certainly would have been aboard one of those little wooden minesweepers, and I didn't want any part of that. And it came out of the plan of the day, uh, looking for volunteers to go to uh, UDT. I guess the teams were, were low in personnel at the time, and they were looking for volunteers to go to uh, go to Bud's training. And so uh, the requirements were to pass a slight PT test, nothing like today, um, and a swim test. The swim test was the critical part. And I had always been a pretty good swimmer, so I had no problem with that. Uh, passed both the PT and the swim test and next thing I know I was in Little Creek, Virginia the, the ironic thing there is that I really didn't have any idea what UDT was or what they did uh, all I could find out was you know, you did a lot of water work you swam a lot so, well, good, I'd like to like to do that I had visions of, you know white sandy beaches and crystal clear water but it wasn't quite that way you know, the Chesapeake Bay is far from it so anyway, when I when I got into to, uh, UDT training, uh, the guys in our class, I think it was 156 guys in our class, and uh, they started dropping out like flies right after. Well, see, at that time, Hell Week was the third week of training, so uh, guys were dropping quickly, quickly. And uh, after Hell Week, uh, I don't recall how many we still had left in the class, but we graduated 21 guys after it was all over. 159 down to 21. Down to 21, that's right. Now, I was looking at your profile before I gave you a call today, and uh, you said that uh, that was uh, class 13 out here. Class 13. You know, you talk to kids today, and they ask you what class you were in, and, uh, and uh, you tell them, well, class 13, and uh, a lot of them can't count, count that far back. You know, they just, <laughs> they just think, well, here's one old guy that I'm talking to here, and, but uh, anyway, it was great. It was a great career, and uh, I wish I could turn the clock back and go back and do it all over again. Well, I also read up there that you said the class 13 was the hardest Bud's class they've had. It was. It was, without a doubt, the toughest class that ever went through. <laughs> oh, that's great, man. Sure, you're going to say the same thing about yours. Yeah, exactly. You know, they all got easy after my class. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh, fantastic. It was worth it, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was quite a ride, man. It was quite a ride. Are you uh, 
you quit school, joined the Navy, just like I did, you know, never looked back, and uh, you, know, you went to UDT 21 when you graduated. That's correct, yeah, yeah. And you know, the, the funny thing is that throughout my Navy career, I probably attended somewhere in the neighborhood of 33 different schools, and I excelled in all of them. You know, for a guy that really didn't like school, it must have been something about the military and the way they trained you or something that really got your interest up if you enjoyed the military. Got your interest up and you really threw yourself into whatever the school was. So, and it, and it all worked out well for me, that's for sure. Great. So, uh, UDT 22 and the uh, uh, the very cool part, I went there. Uh, you were a plank owner at Team 2. At SEAL Team 2, yeah. Now, I went to, uh, Thad Turner was a uh, young SEAL with me at Team 2, and his uh, uncle was uh, Harry Williams, Lump Lump. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And uh, when he died, we all uh, loaded up uh, our dress uniforms and went to his, uh, you know, stood head-to-toe uh, watches on his casket during his wake, and uh, oh, I was very proud to do that. Oh, Lump Lump was a great guy. He was a good shipmate and just a, a good friend. There, was, there, was, there wasn't a bad quality about that guy. And you know the sad thing about it is he stayed single for so long, then he finally met Mary and they got married and he was the happiest guy on, the, on earth and uh, they would ride around on the motorcycle and go to various places and I guess she played a, a piano and uh, he I never knew that he played a harmonica but he uh, played a harmonica and sang a little bit. So they really enjoyed their life together and if you got to go out that's a good way to go. Yeah, I guess he was uh, quite something up there, and you know, not only his SEAL days, but uh, they told a lot of stories about him impressing all the women over to pool, being a retired SEAL, and uh, holding his breast so long, going back and forth uh, across the pool, entertaining the women. But you know, he was also a heavyweight fighter. Was he? He was uh, Atlantic Fleet champ for a couple of years, yeah. I'll be doggone. Uh, light heavyweight champ, uh, Atlantic Fleet. He had fast hands. Boy, <laughs> he, could, he could slap your side of the head before you even thought it was coming. Yeah. But uh, great guy, good friend, good, good teammate. Well, how were you and Harry in the, uh, now there were 50 guys selected from UDT to uh, form the first team at two. Well, I think Roy Baum, Lieutenant Commander, uh, when he retired, uh, Lieutenant Junior Grade at the time, uh, Roy Baum was picked to be the officer in charge. John mm. Callahan was our first commanding officer, but John was away at uh, uh, CO school or whatever they had for commanding officers, some sort of training, and it took a few months to go through all of this, and in the meantime, Roy was assigned as the officer in charge, and we all viewed him basically as our CO. Uh, Roy was a uh, World War II bosun mate, uh, made LDO, and uh, he was of the mindset that uh, if we're going to have an organization like this, I want guys that uh, didn't have the, the cleanest uh, records prior to the military, if you will. Uh, maybe if you had a, oh, a couple speeding tickets, or in other words, you weren't totally white. Uh, you weren't afraid to take a chance in his mind. So those are the kind of guys that he wanted. Plus, he wanted experienced guys, Roy, uh, picked them up, bumped, and... Uh, Red Cannons, a lot of those guys that had been around the Navy for a while. Uh, I was fortunate enough, I think I was third class when I when, I, when we started, and um, the, uh, the attitude was for SEAL Team 2 was you had to be career oriented, you had to be second class, and uh, in the Navy over six years. Well, I was third class, but I was selected by Roy because he had seen my diving qualities, and uh, basically he taught me how to dive. So he uh, pulled me up with a couple of other seamen and uh, third class uh, petty officers, and we were we were you know part of that original 50 group. He also believed that uh, you know enlisted men were just as smart, uh, regardless of what their educational background was. But uh, they were sailors now, and by golly, they had responsibility, and they ought to be able to accept the responsibility. So. A lot of times if there was a small job going someplace or whatever, he would give a petty officer or a junior enlisted or a senior enlisted, either one, uh, the responsibility uh, to be acting basically as the officer in charge. 
even though you might have been second class or first class. Uh, you were responsible for whatever the size group you had, and it was never really big. It might be five, six, seven guys, something like that, but you were the leader. And uh, he expected you to conduct yourself as a leader. And if you made a mistake, he never really jumped on it. His attitude was, if you make this mistake, learn from it, don't make the mistake again, which was really good. And it made the guy step up to the plate and accept the responsibility that he placed on him, and they excelled. They really excelled. I was uh, uh, Roy and uh, Red. I met them both up at Harry's uh, thing, and uh, we went to the VFW. We spent a few nights in the VFW. <laughs> you know how that goes. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, those guys, that uh, you know, the drinks were on the house and everything. It was fantastic talking to those guys, but uh, especially Roy and uh, Red. And, uh, you know, that Roy's gone, but, uh, you know, fantastic stories. I, I love that story about the Roy was telling about President Kennedy calling the quarter deck at uh, Team 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was <laughs> Nobody believed it, but... Gary, he did. And you want to relate that one? Well, it was uh, it was kind of a strange thing. I didn't have the quarter deck much at the time, but I was close to the end. And a call came in, and it, they said they wanted to talk to Lieutenant Bohm. And the quarter deck watch, their, their uh, orders were to find out who's calling, make them identify themselves before you passed it on to whoever they wanted. Well, the <laughs> The lad on the quarter deck said, well, who's calling? They said, well, this is the White House calling. So uh, they didn't really want to believe that. So uh, I guess finally uh, uh, somebody went back and got, got Roy and brought him up there. And uh, they said, hey, Skipper, you know, some jerks on the phone here uh, said it's called from the White House. And, uh, from the White House. And Roy said, uh, well, it probably is. Well, we thought he was pulling our leg, too. So now, by now, we've got a crowd on the quarter deck that just supposedly called from the White House. So finally, the, whoever it was on the other end said, I'm telling you, put your officer, your commanding officer, on the phone right now. So the kid just handed the phone over to Roy, and uh, Roy picked it up and said, uh, hello. And the guy on the other end, John F. Kennedy, identified himself. And Roy's next words were, yes, Mr. President, what can I do for you? Uh, he, we almost had six guys passing out on the quarter deck, but came directly in. And, you know, a, an incident like that happened again um, after Vietnam when Dick Marcinko came back, and he was the CEO of, uh, of SEAL Team 2. He had a, an incident that uh, Cambodia was going down, and a CNO of the Cambodian Navy and Marcinko were pretty good friends. And I got a call from... And, and I was the, the officer of the day at the time. I was chief petty officer by now, and uh, doing the OD uh, uh, responsibilities for that day. And the kid on the court deck said, "Hey, chief, this guy says he's General Brown from the Joint Chiefs of Staff." And I thought, "Oh God!" So I got on the phone and I said, uh, "Excuse me, sir. Uh, I'm Chief Drew Miller. What can I do for you?" And he said, "This is General Brown from the JCS. I want to talk to uh, Commander Marcinko." And I said, just a minute, sir. So I walked back and I got Marcinko and I said, hey, Skipper, some dude on the phone is saying he's chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, wants to call you. It must be one of your old buddies. So he, he told me, he said, just wait, listen to this. And he picked up the phone and he said, hey, Skinny. I guess that must have been a nickname for General Brown. But he said, Skinny, what the hell do you want me to do? What do, what do you need now? And uh, in Marcinko's sarcastic way, he could do that. And uh, sure enough, it was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Well, Cambodia was going down, and the chief of naval operations wanted Dick Marcinko to get him out of Cambodia into some safe haven someplace. And uh, they made an arrangement, and within, oh, 15 minutes, Marcinko was talking directly to Cambodia, to the CNO, trying to arrange something to get him out to, to a safe haven. So it's amazing the things they could do, it, but... Uh, it happens. Seal Team 2 has got a lot, a lot of memories of things like that. Yeah, it sure as hell does, and it continues on today, you know. Yeah, yeah, it sure does. It sure does. And I'm sure you saw the uh, uh, the pictures of JFK when he came down and did his visitation at, over at NOB. But, you know, he had uh, half the fleet was out there with their aircraft carriers and everybody else, and all he wanted to see were the SEALs. 
Well, that was funny. The uh, you know when George Bush Jr. Uh, he went over his last day uh, as president, went over and commissioned the USS George Bush, named for his father. And uh, instead of doing anything else, as soon as he commissioned that ship, he showed up at SEAL Team 10 and wanted to talk to everybody. You know, line them up. You know, this is the last thing I'm going to do as president is shake these guys' hands. So uh, I think that's great. That's great. You know, and I had an opportunity when uh, recently when John McCain was doing his campaign traveling around the country, uh, I got his sister-in-law got me coerced into being one of the drivers for his entourage of people, which, you know, I didn't mind doing that. So I was, and uh, as we got to the airport when he was getting ready to depart, they, he called all the drivers on and said, come on over, let's get a picture individually with each one of them. And uh, I just happened to be the last guy in the line right by the ramp going up into the aircraft. And when he got there, he came over and got my picture, and I said, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I said, uh, Mr. McCain, I'm sorry to, to uh, I've got to apologize to you. And he said, for, for what? And I said, well, I was a SEAL. And he said, you were a SEAL? I said, oh, yes, sir. I worked at uh, Little Creek at, the, Creek at the Antwerp Base, and I knew your dad real well. And uh, so he brought his wife over and introduced me to her. And I said, well, again, sir, I need to apologize to you for what? And he said, for what? And I said, because we didn't get you out of that PRW camp up in uh, Hanoi. And uh, he said, uh, he just grabbed me and hugged me and just almost got a tear in his eye. And he said, just thank you for everything. So that was, you know, it's a memorable moment. And uh, yeah, that, that certainly put the Secret Service on, on guard because he didn't know what was going on. Here's this guy grabbing a senator. Yeah, he's quite a so, badass. You know, those are moments you'll remember for the rest of your life. And uh, just, just great things. People, you act like a, a man. You uh, conduct yourself accordingly in a professional manner. And uh, they respect you for it. And, I think the majority of them treat you the, the, the same way. Yeah, he's quite a badass. So uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, now, when you formed up at Team Two, uh, being a plank owner, you know, I was a plank owner on a, uh, a ship, and uh, boy, that's uh, just a, you know every you know, trying to figure everything out. But uh, you know, you guys got that. I remember Roy talking about the you know commandeering weapons and uh, getting in trouble for buying weapons off the open market. You know and Kennedy had to straighten all that out. You know, they gave him that lump of money to pull that together. Uh, but uh, going into your deployments in Vietnam, I was reading a lot, and uh, you're very quick to credit uh, Army Special Forces for uh, pulling, uh, you know, a lot of the training together. Well, Roy's attitude was that if the Navy was going to have an organization such as SEAL teams, that uh, they needed to, he needed to get them to invest a lot of money into each individual, and the best way to do that is get them off to these various schools. So we just had school after school after school that guys were attending, and uh, we didn't have any uniforms. Our Octar hadn't been even approved yet. Uh, Hood Andrews was trying to put that thing together, but in the meantime, we were sending guys down to Fort Bragg, and they were out fitting us with jump boots and greens and uh, doing everything they possibly could to help us out. They would come up to us. In fact, Roy, I think, probably spent more time down at Fort Bragg than he did at Little Creek for the first eight or nine months. But uh, they, they did a great job. They let us go to their schools on no-cost orders They because uh, we didn't, again, have the, the training budget to, to go to some of these schools. And guys would go uh, on their own expense just to get the, the qualification. And the Army was good, and they would put us up in billets, and they would uh, uh, train us. And, and Clovis. So, yeah, I do give a, a lot of credit to those guys. Uh, young SEALs today don't realize that, and there's probably some professional jealousies between the two organizations, but uh, I, I could never say enough for those guys. They were all World War II veterans and Korean veterans, so they had been around the block a few times, and uh, they knew what was going on. They knew what kind of an organization we were starting, so they again treated you accordingly. Now, uh, Bill, did you deploy uh, in UDT over to Vietnam? No, no. I did three uh, deployments to Vietnam, and they were all the SEALs. And so, uh, when did the uh, what was your first deployment like over there? The first deployment was I, I took the dog. We went uh, there you go. our first, uh, let's see, we were at a PBR base in, uh, in Ben Tui, uh, in the town of Canto. And then uh, we moved up to Mito, and we, and I, you know, I had the dog with me during that time. And we used them sparingly, not as much as we would have liked to. Uh, and probably uh, part of it was because he had not been trained in booby trap detection or anything else. But the great thing about the dog was 
beaches and stuff where we were going up to AP Hill. And uh, the dog is around gunfire, and so it, it never bothered him. So if you were laying out on an ambush and that dog was right next to me, between his hearing and his smelling, uh, he knew probably five minutes before we did that somebody was starting to come down that river. And all he did was his ears, ears would perk up and he'd just turn his head and look in that direction. And then when the shooting started, he just lay right there by my side, wouldn't, wouldn't move or, you know, get antsy or scared or anything like that. He's a really great dog. Well, I had uh, been reading a little bit. You originally uh, got that dog from the uh, Norfolk Police Department. That's correct. Yeah, I sure did. Uh, and you and Bo Burwell idea. trained these dogs. Yeah, I had the idea that, uh, you know, we're going over here and maybe having a dog would uh, give us a little bit of an advantage. And uh, Rick Marcinko was going to be the assistant officer in charge of my platoon. And uh, he was an ensign at the time. And uh, he said, sure, do it. And... Uh, Commander Early was the uh, CO, and he approved it, so I went down to the Norfolk Police, and not only did they train me, but they gave me the dog to use, and uh, put me through training free of charge, and uh, did as much training, you know, as we possibly could that would be applicable to uh, military operations, searching, you know, stuff like that, they'd hide stuff, and the dog would find it out, and that worked out, uh, the ambushes worked out. Uh, the attack worked out. I had to do that a couple of times, uh, send them out to somebody. So, all in all, it, it worked out pretty good. Uh, he really got good when Mike Bailey, when, when I came back and turned him over to Mike Bailey, and Mike took him to the regular military training down in Fort Benning. Uh, that's when Pritch really excelled and uh, evidently did some, some great things with Mike over in Vietnam up in I Corps. Uh, saved quite a few guys with detection of uh, not only booby traps but uh, ambushes that were set up. Uh, what they would, what they trained the dog to do, if they were going into an area where there was heat, I guess it was a dangerous area. If there was somebody there setting up an ambush or about to ambush you, the dog would lean against his handler and try to push him away from from that direction. And Mike was telling me a story that they were running a uh, a point element. Uh, for a marine company and uh, I don't know how that ever got set up but anyway uh, the SEALs were running a point element for this marine company and uh, the dogs alerted on uh, some sand dunes uh, area and uh, evidently Mike told the, the officer in charge of the marines that hey the dog's alerting there's something up there we don't want to go that way well they decided that they weren't going to pay attention to the dogs. Uh, seals went one way, the range went the other, and uh, they uh, lost a couple of guys and had a uh, few guys wounded too. So uh, they know what they're doing. They train them well at Fort Benning, and the dogs know what they're doing. So I they had, pay attention to them. Yeah. I had uh, uh, done a little bit of reading, and I, I remember uh, a story. Now, you and I weren't at Team 2 together. But uh, as I was reading a little bit about your work with the dogs, uh, I read about you muzzling the dog before you jumped with him. And I thought I remembered a story at Team 2 about why you would muzzle him. Well, Prince was, Prince was all right. He, uh, none of the dogs really <laughs> jumped out of airplanes. And again, we had to develop our own procedure for jumping with this dog. You know, you'd hook him on a harness, up underneath your reserve. These are static line jumps. Uh, and you'd hook them up under your reserve and try to lure them by uh, on a bungee line, you know, as you got closer to the ground. Well, uh, a fellow by the name of Schwallenberg had a dog named Silver. And Silver, of all the dogs, and I think at the time, if I remember correctly, we had four dogs. Three of the four didn't really like it, but they never really, you know, you had them out the door before they realized what was going on. Silva really didn't like it. He almost ate Schwallenberg up on the way down. So we decided <laughs> we've got to find a better way to do this thing. We've got to muzzle these dogs. Okay, we muzzle the dogs. The second jump, and I can almost still see the picture, we're getting ready to go out of the aircraft, and uh, this fellow's got his, his dog up under his reserve. And that dog, as he got to the door, that dog spread out all four legs like, you ain't getting me out of this airplane. <laughs> I mean, the guys were cracking up in the aircraft. And he had to pull his legs in to, to get him out of there. But that, that dog.
Armstrong didn't like any part of jumping whatsoever. And every time he got down on the ground, old Wally would almost get eaten alive by him once he took the muzzle off. And that is, uh, I was, uh, Tom Keith was a big sea daddy of mine, and uh, he'd tell that story about the, you know, the team being down on the beach when Marcinko and the other guy did that uh, that extraction method, but uh, had told the story about they did it on a pig before Marcinko did it, and the, yeah. the pig's reaction to being hooked up in that uh, thing the second time was not good. That that pig was going nowhere near that harness, and uh, <laughs> so that's when they said, "No help, let's just put Marcinko in it." You know. That's right. That's right. I was down there uh, the day that Jim Fox got killed, but uh, yeah, that skyhook operation. I haven't got a chance to do it myself, and we didn't do it very often. I think Marcinko did it, Jim McGee did it, uh, Van Hurdum did it, and there might have been a couple of other guys that did it, and Jim Fox was the fellow that got killed on that, that one, uh, one event. And uh, it was a mechanical failure, really, that, yeah. that killed him. But uh, uh, we never really got a chance to use it over in Vietnam, but it was a, a procedure that certainly would have worked if, if we had to, you know, had to pull a guy out of the denied area. It's... Uh, Quite a thing to watch that guy sitting on the ground. A plane comes by, and all of a sudden he's he just jerked up like a big elastic band, just doom, catapults him up into the sky. You know, Tom Keith told me they uh, did it to that pig that first time, and uh, he said then that pig got ripped off the ground, and uh, shit blew out of his ass about ten feet. <laughs> It ripped him up in that airplane, and that pig, uh, they landed him. He said the pig was fine when they brought him back down to the beach, but as soon as that pig saw that harness coming back at him, he was like, there ain't no way. I know what that is, you know, so. <laughs> Great stuff. Pigs, pigs are really, you know, people don't understand, but uh, pigs are very, very smart animals. Mm. Pigs are one of the biggest things that we had to look out for over in Vietnam. I had a couple of occasions where we were going into an area to, uh, that we had gotten some previous intel that there was some high-level VCI coming in and we wanted to capture these guys. Well, I remember laying out there and we had a little ambush set up and we're laying there just waiting for people to show up and all of a sudden this pig came walking out of his hooch, walked right up to us, looked at us, turned around, walked back up to the hooch and you could hear him in there going, just raising all kinds of cane, telling his owner that, Hey, there's somebody outside here. <laughs> Holy shit, a pig. Uh, you got ratted out by a pig. Yes, I'm ratted out by a pig. Oh, man. So uh, what happened after the pig ratted you out? Did you guys get the upper hand? Well, the first time that the pig did it, and the guy wasn't paying attention, the pig came back out, looked at us again, and went back in and did it again. So then we figured, this guy's going to really give us up, so we got to take some evasive action here, so... Uh, we shot the, the pig when he came back down. We shot him with the silencer, and uh, fortunately, we hit him right and uh, it killed him right away. But uh, it could, that could have gone sour too. But yeah, that, we've had a couple occasions. Kind of pigs and geese, boy, those are early warning devices over there. Yeah, the guys hear a lot about you know. I, uh, you know, Tom uh, certainly taught me uh, so much about booby traps, and uh, I went on to do. Uh, some very big things with that stuff, you know, big uh, explosives guy, but, uh, you know, guys don't really realize that, but still the uh, cheapest, most effective uh, early warning devices uh, turn out to be dogs and geese sometimes, you know, they don't eat much, they, you know, very alert, and, uh, you know, all these mercury switches and trip wires and everything else, you know, a few dogs and geese, very hard to get through. The, the, first, the first silent weapon we had was a 9 millimeter. And it was put together by the Naval Ordnance Lab up in Silver Springs, Maryland. I think that's where it was. And uh, we went out to uh, set up an ambush or to capture some people. I don't remember exactly what the, the mission was, but we were about a mile off of the river. The PBRs inserted us into an area, and we're patrolling back in to where these people were supposed to meet. And all of a sudden, this dog started raising hell well. Dick Marcenko had the, as we call him, a hush puppy. And, and uh, he said, I'll, I'll quiet that dude down. So he took the gun out and took a shot at him. Well, it didn't kill that dog, but it sure made him angry. And all we heard was yipping all over the place. And all of a sudden, there's a lot of people looking for us. So we had to get the hell out of there and get back. And we set up a hasty ambush on the way back and killed a few of them, get back on the river. So, uh, you're right. Dogs, dogs can be a, an early warning uh, system. Uh, pigs, uh, geese. Uh, you never know what you're going to 
going to run into. You can plan an operation to the nth degree, and you better have one or two backups because I don't think I ever went on an operation that went 100% like we had planned it. There's always something that's going to cause you to alter your plan. Then it could be a dog or it could be a pig that you don't anticipate being there. So you've got to be prepared to, to improvise. And I think I think that's one of the greatest thing about SEALs is they, they know how to improvise. Uh, and if they didn't, you know, we'd probably lost a heck of a lot more SEALs than we have. But uh, their ability to improvise and make change and uh, judgment, you know, on the spot uh, has probably saved a lot of guys' lives too. Yeah, I've, I've uh, written a blog before called uh, Comedy of Errors, and it's it's uh, just a struggle to keep the ops going. It, it seems like the minute uh, you insert, uh, things start going wrong, and where most guys would just, uh, you know, back away or, you know, just call it a day, you know, we just fight these things the entire way through and just keep pulling them together. We're just kind of masters of... Uh, you know, it's hard to knock, uh, you know, punch a seal and knock him down. You know, you keep getting up, you keep moving, you keep rolling, you know, the weather being busted, whatever. But uh, Yeah, that's yeah. true. And, uh, you know, they, they will get you. And you might you might get the upper hand for a little bit, but then eventually they will get you. Yeah. So, uh, Roll with the punches, you know, make it work. You know, things start going wrong and uh, you know, got to be able to switch yeah, it up. Yeah, that's just an ask me. You know, all that goes back to buds. They all they do is teach you to be a winner, teach you to be a winner, and that uh, gets into your vocabulary. And even today, uh, in civilian life, whatever you do, uh, you don't take no for an answer. You know, uh, you may say, you know, or whoever you, whatever the issue may be, and somebody tells you no. Well, that's that's certainly not good enough. Because I think there's a better way to do it. We can get around that. No. And uh, you just never give up. Uh, how many tours did you do in Vietnam? Pardon me? Uh, how much time in Vietnam? Uh, three trips. Yeah. And we did six month deployments. Uh, each each trip was a six month deployment, and I did three of them. I was. Uh, how often did you uh, did you have the dogs with you every time? No, just uh, the first the first deployment that I was on, we had a dog. Uh, the second deployment. Uh, there were dogs there, but not in, not in my platoon. In the third one, we didn't. We were down in Chongqian Province, and uh, we didn't have any dogs down there either. Yeah, I uh, I'll get off of the dogs and ask you a few other things. But I I was reading the story, and I'm not sure if it was Prince or not who uh, came back and uh, was carrying something in his mouth and uh, throwing it around, and it turned out to be a a hand grenade. Yeah, well, that was that was with me. We. Uh, we're out on a patrol one day, we're just searching, just searching around, looking for weapons and trying to find, uh, you know, weapons factories and things like that. And, and all the weapons factory was in Vietnam was a hooch that, you know, they put uh, weapons together, or booby traps together or stuff like that. And uh, the dog, uh, when you go through police training, you've got the dog with, with a working collar. And once you put that collar on, he knows it's all work. Well, when you decide to stop and take a break, you tell the dog, take a break. And you just take the leash off him and, and let him go. And uh, I was leaned up against a tree, and Prince came back, and he was just kind of in a, he almost had a spiral on his face, and he dropped this thing by my leg, thinking it was a ball, like, you know, I used to take a ball and throw it, and he'd go get it and bring it back. Well, he thought this was a ball, and he dropped it by my leg, and it scared the living hell out of me. It was a, a hand grenade. So I took it away from him, and uh, I said, no, and off he went. Came back again with another one. So I thought, well, hell, we better check this out. So I followed him, and uh, we went back, and we found a pretty pretty sizable weapons cache. I'll be damned. <laughs> I'll tell you, a dog drops a hand grenade between your legs. That's what gets your attention. That'll wake you up, I guess. It sure does. How did how did Prince get the Purple Heart? Uh, we were on an ambush, and uh, there were some hand grenades flying back and forth, and uh, a mortar hit, and a couple of guys got some shrapnel. I got some, and he got some. But it wasn't really bad, but it was certainly enough to uh, give him a, you require medical attention and remove the... Uh, I think it was Doc Nix 
bags and removed the shrapnel from him and uh, gave him, you know, bandaged him up, and he got better in a very short period of time and back on the job. So they, they put him into the Purple Heart, and he got it. Uh, what was your... Uh, another, I think he got another one later on, too, when he was with Mike Bailey. I was showing the guys some of the uh, pictures of the modern dogs that they have over there now, uh, overseas, and uh, hell, we've got dogs in the uh, SEAL team with Navy crosses, and uh, I think we got one with two of them. Really? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Mm. Yeah, crazy what they uh, ask those animals to do, and uh, boy, you know, they're just lifesavers, you know, so it's well, all started with guys what, like you. You talk about your swim buddy and uh, all your buddies in SEAL team, well, that dog gets as close to you as as any one of those other guys in your uh, that, that you're dealing with, you know, your swim buddy or anybody else, they uh, they really get right into your heart, and there isn't a thing they wouldn't do for you. That's for sure. They did a movie of uh, Vietnam dogs one time, and I, I think it's called War Dogs. And I saw that thing one time, and it's unbelievable. Now we didn't have any experiences with our dogs that I know of, like some of the Army guys did. And boy, I'll tell you. The Air Force used to use uh, dogs for perimeter security, but uh, the Army, some of the guys up around I Corps and places like that were heavy involvement of uh, NBA and stuff. These guys are giving to just massive ambushes. Got to the dog handle, might get uh, shot and knocked down. And it, I mean, they had pictures of the dog dragging this guy out of the kill zone. It was, it's just unbelievable what they do for you. There was a picture of one dog that just laid over his master or over his handler to try to protect him. And uh, when the dogs get shot up, and it just breaks your heart. Outside of uh, you know being the uh, being with the dog in a uh, platoon patrol, what was your what was your position in the patrol? What'd you typically do uh, in Vietnam? Well, usually if I had the dog, if we took the dog with us, it'd be point man. And if it wasn't, I'd be probably either rear security. Uh, uh, machine gunner. Most of the time, if I didn't have the dog, had the dog, I'd carry a shotgun. If I didn't have the dog, I'd probably carry an M16 with a, a 40 mic mic uh, launcher, you know, underneath a 203 underneath it, and just regular, you know, line of march. Easy day. And uh, you you deployed with the dogs on uh, your first kind of second deployment. Uh, what year was your last deployment in Vietnam? My last deployment, I was one of the last platoons uh, in Vietnam, and that was uh, oh, December of uh, 1970 into uh, 71. We are down in Changchun province, and that's when everything was winding down, and all the guys were coming home, and the VC were moving down and rapidly from up north. And as soon as we left, they uh, they took over Saigon. And that, the, the seals left, but. Uh, as soon as the Americans pulled out. We've seen movies of the evacuation up there in Saigon. So it was right around that time. But, uh, yeah, 70, 71, June of 71, I think, is what we, when we left country and headed back to the States. And when was your first trip over? Uh, 67. I'll be yeah, doggone. 67. And doggone. the second one was in 68. Uh, I was over there for 10 of 68, which really... Uh, <laughs> it was quite an experience, and uh, we learned a lot about underestimating the enemy because they were very sly and cunning, and uh, uh, they had weapons cached in uh, cemeteries, and uh, they were really quite creative about how they did this thing. And uh, uh, right under the nose of the, you know, the Vietnamese government, the Vietnamese military, and the American military, what they do is they hold a funeral. And everybody would show respect. You know, Americans, we, we have a lot of respect, and there's a funeral possession go, and everybody pulls their car over, it's every, everything. And uh, it's basically that way. Well, these caskets, supposedly with a body, nobody ever looked into them. They were full of weapons. And these guys were just parading through town, down to the cemetery, bury this thing in a point, and uh, it'd be weapons. But what we didn't pick up on was they were marking the spots with little flags so that when Ted started, anybody that went into that cemetery, all they had to do was look for this little marker, dig it up, and there were weapons there for them. Yeah, they were, they were all, all uh, pre uh, throughout the country. 
Bill, were uh, your uh, ops over in Vietnam typically in and out type things? Do you uh, spend any time? Uh, what do you mean? Overnighters, uh, in at dark, out at sunrise? or? Uh, yeah, we, we did a few of those. Uh, a lot of times our operations were basically uh, at night, you know, uh, unless we were going into an area where we want to capture somebody where we knew they were there during the day. We'd do a helicopter insert almost right directly on top of the target, uh, jump the people in and get them out of there. But uh, anything after that was all ambushes at night and uh, body snatches at night. So you'd get out uh, right, be, right at dark as uh, the sun went down. Uh, you'd uh, insert wherever your target area was, and then patrol up, set your ambush up, whatever. And if you got a hit, you'd call for an extraction. If you didn't get a hit, uh, you'd call for an instruction as the sun was coming up the next day. So usually it was overnighters. And how did you execute those uh, prisoner snatches? I mean, what's a uh, what's typically that going on? You're just uh, you're grabbing a guy, and how would you form that up into a platoon? Well, what we do is if uh, we knew they were coming to a particular area, we'd get a uh, let's say a squad of guys and we'd put a, 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 a perimeter around the house that they were supposed to, to meet in. We, we had a, a procedure for getting our own intelligence. We never really paid a whole lot of attention to the uh, standard core intel because it was never, uh, it was never uh, recent, you know, it may be six, eight months old. So uh, we found out that you get yourself in a lot of trouble when you work on, on tell that intel that's that old so we had a process for getting our own and uh, what we do is they're going to meet at, at this uh, hooch we put a little uh, perimeter around that hooch and wait for them to come in and then uh, we just bust into the hooch and grab them and, and take them on back we put uh, you know tie wraps on their wrists and take them back and every once in a while you might have to uh, you'd have a little bit of a tussle with them and uh, uh, but then they'd get a busted lip or maybe a punch in the stomach. But we never really got called for that. But uh, I guess today you can't do that. Uh, I do remember one story. I wasn't there, but uh, Eddie Leisure uh, is dead now. But Ed and uh, uh, his squad, I guess, were going in to capture some people. And uh, the, the, uh, the enemy bent in this little hooch, and they were having their meeting inside. So the officer in charge and Eddie decide, well, how are we going to get into this hooch? Well, it's just a grass, little grass hut, so let's just run right through the walls. So they did. They ran right through the walls, and they got inside. And evidently, there was only about three people in there. One guy ran outside. They grabbed him right away. The second guy ran, and they grabbed him. Well, that left Eddie Leisure inside with the third person. And they had the damnedest fight going on inside. And finally, the guys that were outside were telling me this story. They said, all of a sudden you heard Eddie yell out, God damn it, lady, you can't do that to me. <laughs> well, it turned out that this female was a, a VC, uh, a North Vietnamese colonel. And uh, she must have been pretty, pretty adapted in martial arts and, or whatever, but... When Eddie came back out of there, his face was all scratched up. He had to knock her out so uh, to get her out of there. But his face was all scratched up. Uniform was all torn. It was hilarious. And the guys outside said they could hardly do their job because they're laughing so hard. But he said, "God damn it, lady! Don't you know who I am? I'm a Navy SEAL." What would you, uh, Bill? What would you call your most successful op on those three uh, cru uh, cruises you did? The most successful one. I think probably the most successful was that on, on my last uh, my last uh, uh, deployment was through some indigenous agency people. Uh, you know, the CIA was winding down, and, and the guys that they had been using uh, were now unemployed, so they were looking to get money any way they could. So I had a couple of them come to uh, our my intel petty officer Barry Fries and say, "Hey, listen, we have some." some information. So Barry came to me and he said, hey, I got a couple of guys who want to meet and talk about intel collection. So Barry and I went uh, down to the little city square and we met with these guys over coffee and we talked and they told me that uh, they had a very high level VCI that wanted to collaborate uh, because he needed money. Well, I said, uh, get some information 
information for me, what have you, to prove who this guy is. And oh, within a week, I had some documents that I took up to. Uh, I didn't want to turn it over to the regular military, so I turned it over to uh, the courts people were, you know, the agency people, basically, and uh, gave them the information. And uh, they said, okay, this seems to be pretty accurate after they checked it all out. I guess the information... Uh, gave indication of uh, some targets that were going to be hit by the BC and uh, that proved out to be true. So they asked me to go back in and get some more information, which I did, and some specific uh, details on something, which I did, got the answers back for them, and then they wanted to uh, bring this guy out. They wanted to be able to interrogate him uh, face-to-face. Well, the only way the guy would come out uh, through buying indigenous guys was that an American had to go in and get them. You're not supposed to be armed or anything like that. So uh, I talked to my officer in charge and I said, you yeah, know, I just have a warm feeling that this is right and uh, this is the real thing and I'm willing to go chance it and let's see what happens. So he let me do it and I went in with these two guys and got this guy out of there, got him into a sort of a disguise got him into a vehicle, got him into a plane, got him up to Canto, uh, spent overnight. The agency had a guy, uh, an interrogator, come down, talk to him, and uh, I did this three times. Come to find out, this guy was the number one guy in, in three corps, which is our four corps uh, region, and uh, he was the number one guy. He didn't even know how important he was. But uh, what was happening is the VCU didn't have money or anything, and so these people that were BC in that, that three core area were having to go out and raise money or raise their own rice or find ways to support themselves. They were not, no longer getting uh, uh, subsidized, if you will, by the by the NVA or by the USDFL at all. So uh, he was doing whatever he could to get get money for his family. His wife had tuberculosis, so we got him some. Uh, uh, some false documents that allowed his wife to travel on a bus back and forth from one area to another. Uh, and then that gets a, uh, stopped by the Vietnamese police, and she could get the drugs that she needed and then get back to her, her location safely. So, come to find out, to the long story short, the information that this fellow was giving me was going directly to Washington. I mean, it was some pretty heavy stuff talking about the final days that were, were coming and what the uh, uh, North Vietnamese were planning and how they were uh, planning their movements, I guess, down into that three core area. So I think that was probably, of all of them, that was probably the most successful that I was ever on. We had a lot of successful ambushes, you know, where we, where we killed a lot of people and got a lot of weapons. I think, uh, oh golly, I think, I want to say the kill ratio for SEAL Team 2 during the Vietnam period was something like 3,300, and I believe we lost a total of nine. We had about 90% of our guys that went in country got wounded, but uh, I think that was the the, uh, the body count with weapons and everything. About 3,300 we killed, and we only lost nine of our own guys. Well, that's a uh, fantastic record. I was uh, uh, reading something with uh, you and Bo. Were you, uh, Bo was talking about the bare feet and the blue jeans. Uh... We had a guy by the name of Toothman. Fred Toothman came from Panama. And old Fred was, he was just one of those easy, laid back kind of guys that never really was status quo, you know. And, uh, I guess Fred, uh, in his youth, uh, just used to run the jungles in Panama with bare feet. And so Vietnam was just like being back home to him. Trying to get a pair of boots on Fred just didn't work. He was always barefooted out there. Then we found out that, uh, you know, why did we have to wear these, these green trousers with a pair of Levi's for get you a lot tighter and uh, for whatever reason you were a lot quieter in, uh, in the Levi's than you were in these other things that kept getting stagged up bushes and what have you. So guys would wear, wear uh, Levi's and nobody ever complained about it. But we did our own thing, you know. We we didn't have anybody outside. If you weren't a SEAL, uh, you didn't go with us. And if you weren't a SEAL, you didn't tell us what to do either. So we did it our way, which was good. 
Well, you'd be proud to know that uh, so many of those traditions are still going on. You'll never find two seals dressed the same way. Uh, the blue jeans are still in full force and uh, yeah, a lot of that stuff. And, uh, yeah, guys pretty much, uh, you know, a seal, we don't want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, whatever, whatever makes the guy comfortable, whatever he's comfortable doing and yeah. uh, wearing, then by God, let him do it. That's, you know. Yeah. That's the way to go. It's not like World War II, you know, where you had to have a uniform on and there were lines, defied the lines. When you're working in an environment like they're working in today or we worked in in Vietnam, there weren't any lines. I mean, so who was to say you were enemy or or anything else? You know, you you uh, if you weren't American, then you most likely were the enemy. But uh, uniforms, it was a whole different category. It was, well, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you uh, taking the time out. There's a uh, there's so many good guys out here, and so many guys are going to see this later that could not be here tonight. But uh, you know, I'm looking to comments down here. Just a real respectful bunch of young guys, uh, for the most part, that want to become seals one day. So you know, with all your background, all those combat tours, uh, uh, everything you did in UDT and all the training, man. What the what's the what would you tell them all, man? You know, I think that uh, uh, think hard about, about what you're, you're getting yourself into. Learn as much as you can before you get involved in it. Because once you start or once you commit yourself uh, to Bud's training, then uh, it's up to you to get it through. You take every day, one day at a time, and the instructors are there to teach you, but they're also there to weed you out. If you're not going to fit what we determine uh, the profile of a good seal, then uh, they're going to get you out of that. So make sure you understand what you're getting yourself into. Get yourself as physically prepared as you possibly can, and uh, just just be ready for it. Once you graduate, when they put that Budweiser on your chest, you're going to be the proudest guy in the world, and you're going to establish relationships with people that will go on for the rest of your life. May not see your shipmate for oh twenty years, maybe even longer. But uh, after you retire or get out of the service, but that that uh, friendship is always there, and they're always there for you too. So all it takes is a phone call. I'm a former seal, whether I knew you or not. Uh, let you know that I'm a former seal and I'm in your area. I'd like to get together and figure out what happens. So it's it's a great feeling. We've got a terrific network of. Uh, of seals throughout the country. Uh, a lot of them know each other. A lot of them don't know each other, but they still still communicate. So it's a community that you'll be proud to be in, and that you really want to be in. It's kind of uh, strange, you know. The, these guys, uh, especially nowadays with the advent of you know, when when you certainly went through training, there were no books, there were no movies outside of the Frogman with Richard and Frogman with with Mark, but you know, now in the computer age, there's, I think a lot of these guys suffer from absolute information overload. Uh, yeah. There's just so much bullshit on the internet, they don't know who's writing it, uh, guys giving training tips for what they need to do for buds and they've never even seen the compound, and uh, just a lot of tough stuff out there that these guys have to uh, to deal with today, but you know, when I, uh, I graduated, uh, our guest speaker uh, told us something and uh, it really made a lot of sense that uh, I never realized uh, and he said that these instructors have been trying to turn you guys into SEALs since day one right. and these guys hear so much bad so they never hear anything really good about buds uh, it's all bad stuff and anybody that's ever graduated well you know will tell these guys that buds is a great you know if you can't have fun in seal school you know uh, it's certainly a bitch uh, you'd never want to repeat it but you have a lot of fun and those instructors uh, you had said it uh, they're there to weed you out but they're also there for the guys that are going through to turn them into seals they were here right. to make you seals that's correct they're not there to kill you you're not going to do anything that that uh uh, hundreds of other guys haven't done prior to you, and uh, by Gary, it's up to you. Have a, a strong mental attitude about the thing. Take it one day at a time, and you can do it. And uh, you won't be sorry in the long run. Well, uh, 
uh, certainly a guy that has a, a ton of experience. I'm going to put this, uh, I'm showing these guys this picture of you with uh, Prince up here. Uh, one of my, fa I'll never forget seeing that picture for the first time up at uh, Team 2. And uh, I, I hope that the picture is still hanging up there. But, uh, boy, you know, that uh, that just said uh, everything to me about what team. I had come from Team 1 and uh, went over to Team 2. And, uh, yeah, very, very cool stuff. Very cool. Master Chief, I can't thank you enough, man. It uh, really, really gave these guys a lot of information tonight. Well, Don, I, I got to tell you, uh, any time you'd like to talk to me or any of these young candidates would like to uh, shoot the breeze, I'd be more than happy to do so. And uh, I wish them all the best of uh, luck if they do decide to go into buds. And uh, by God, they can do it. Just be positive. Yeah, hurry up, get it done, get on a uh, uh, helo, grab a weapon, go over there. There's plenty of uh, plenty of people over there that need shot right now. That's right. There's plenty of target area. <laughs> well, badass, I can't uh, can't thank you enough, and I will be in touch, and I'll give you a call back in a little bit because uh, okay, fantastic job, you. and I appreciate it, Bill. Okay, 